Hi, I'm Bart Polson, and this video is a quiz review for lifespan development. In it, we're looking at chapter one, the first quiz, what is lifespan development? Now, hopefully you've already taken the quiz on Canvas, and so I'm not giving away the answers. I'm just trying to explain what you may have gone through already. Now, the way these are numbered, by the way, at the top left it says Q, that's for quiz question. Uh, 01 is the chapter. The point one is the quiz number, because there's two quizzes for each chapter. And the third thing, the dot .01, is the question number. So this is Q01.1.01 .01 means quiz chapter one, num quiz one, question one. Anyhow, um, the first question is, in the Middle Ages, children could be sent to the monastery against their will because they were, A, legally considered property, B, considered to be divine, C, not needed at home, or D, in need of discipline. Well, if you took the quiz, then you would know that the answer for this one is A, they were legally considered property. Children did not have much in the way of rights. People in general didn't, and children were not considered anything really other than small people, and people at that time were often considered something along the lines of chattel or something to be traded and uh, dealt with as seen fit. Anyhow, you could set kids against uh, places against their will, you know, although I think you can still do that. But um, that's question number one. Question number two, which of the following is likely to occur when you remove the bell in school? Now, what this is, is an association between the bell ringing and school ending or the excitement of getting ready or, you know, what have you. Uh, and that's an example of what's called classical conditioning, the building of a passive association. Anyhow, the uh, answers here are A, extinction, B, reinforcement, C, conditioned response, or D, consequence. Now, um, just to give you a quick heads up here, uh, three of these are legitimate psychological terms. D, consequence doesn't count. You know, we talk about with our kids about what are the consequences of your behavior, but that's not what we talk about when we're doing uh, the conditioning research, classical or operant conditioning. Uh, in this case, the answer is A, extinction. And what that is, is you're extinguishing the association between the bell and, for instance, class letting out. There's no longer a... Uh, a, a pairing with them. Reinforcement means that a particular behavior becomes more likely. That's something from what's called operant conditioning or like the dog training school of uh, psychology. And the conditioned response is also has to do with classical conditioning, the Pavlovian dog uh, salivating thing, um, where you would have the excitement of the bell, you know, the, the behavior would be the conditioned response to the bell, but uh, what we have here is simply extinction. That's what's going on. The third question, which of the following would be a mental structure responsible for helping a child determine how to act in a restaurant? These are rather convoluted sentences. Anyhow, the choices are A, scheme, B, adaptation, C, heuristic, or D, pattern. Well, all of these have their places in this uh, course, but the one that we're looking for right here is A, a scheme, sometimes also called a schema. And a scheme is an organization of knowledge. And um, in this case, it's got a whole bit of you walk into the restaurant, you sit at the uh, table, you maybe you wear these kind of clothes, you talk this way, this is what you do before and after. Um, and a scheme is an organization of mental knowledge. Now, in this particular case, it may also have a temporal uh, element to it, you know, uh, a linear, this comes first, this comes second. Now, adaptation, which was B, has to do with... Um, adapting to circumstances and that's something that for instance uh we, piaget talks about when he talks about cognitive development but that's not right now a heuristic is a rule of thumb or a shortcut for thinking it's a big deal in research but it doesn't have to and it has to do with decision making but it doesn't have to do with the restaurant and a pattern uh, just a more general term for how things go together but that's not what we're looking for here question number four what are sudden changes in genetic material that provide differences from parents? So normally you inherit your genetics from your parents. You get, you know, approximately 50% from your mother, 50% from your father. But sometimes you get things that neither one of them has. And we're not talking about recessive traits. We're talking about something that's just totally different. The choices are A, reflexes, B, mutations, C, fixed action patterns, or D, instinctive patterns. Well, the answer in this case is B, mutations. A genetic mutation is when a gene that you have 
um, gets hit by you know a random neutrino or whatever, and it is suddenly different. Not in the sort of combinatorial way you get with mother and father genes combining and so on, but it just gets whacked and it becomes different. And that's where you get unexpected variation. And that's one of the things that can cause a child to be very different from their parents. Now, reflexes are an important part of development, but that has nothing to do with uh, you know genetics, or at least in terms of changing genetics. The fixed action pattern has to do with genetically determined behavioral patterns that you usually see like in insects or small animals. And uh, instinctive patterns have more of the same thing have to do with uh, biological predispositions towards per certain behaviors. But anyhow, the sudden changes in genetic material are mutations. Okay, the fifth question. Which of the following is the preferred method for investiga investigating cause and effect? So now we're talking about research methods or methodology. And if you want to look at what causes a particular outcome, so like what causes depression or what causes people to do better on a test or what causes some people to uh, continue to smoke even when they know it's bad for them, then you can, uh, for instance, the four choices you have in this question are A, a correlational study, B, a case study, C, an experiment, or D, naturalistic observation. Now, these are all legitimate, important methods of gathering and analyzing data. They all have their purposes, but usually the gold standard for cause and effect is going to be C, an experiment. An experiment is where you don't simply watch what's happening. That would be, for instance, a correlational study where you get a whole bunch of data from people, uh, like maybe from a survey, maybe from medical records, maybe from something else. And you simply see what is correlated with what. And correlations are very good for predicting. And sometimes if predicting is all you care about, correlation is, is fine, it's perfect. But if you want to actually say why there's an association, then an experiment's usually better. A case study is when you're looking very intensively at one person. Or if you're in business school, one company. If you're in law school, it's one legal case. Um, but you examine that one in great detail, and there are special methods for dealing with that. A naturalistic observation just means that you go out, for instance, to the real world and you see what's happening, like you go to a park and you watch how kids interact with one another uh, and with their parents. Um, anyhow, but an experiment is for cause and effect. An experiment means that you manipulate the conditions. You cause one group of people to have something different than another group of people, and that is called your independent variable, and you're looking to see how it affects the response, how it changes the response, and that's called your dependent variable. And if you randomly assign people to conditions and you have a large enough group, then you can reasonably assume that the only systematic differences between the groups is the thing that you cause to be different, your manipulation. And that's what's really good about experiments for cause and effect. Okay, number six. In a study to determine whether temperature affects test performance, what is the test performance? So what role does it place in this study? So we're looking at whether temperature affects test performance. Well, our choices are A, that test performance is a dependent variable, or B, it's an independent variable, or C, a correlation coefficient, or D, an experimental group. Well, this is one where we're specifically looking at cause and effect. We want to see how temperature affects cause and effect test performance. And so test performance is the outcome. It's the result. And consequently, it is A, the dependent variable. It's the thing that depends on what happens with the causal variable, which is the independent variable, which is the temperature. So you do an experiment, you have people take a test under in different temperatures, you cause the temperature to be different and you look and see how it affects people's outcomes. And so uh, test performance is the dependent variable. Temperature is the independent variable. And you would actually be looking for the correlation coefficient between those two things as a way of assessing how much of a relationship there was between the two. An experimental group, well, you would have, uh, for instance, at least two experimental groups, maybe one group that, that's in a room that's at, you know, 70 degrees, another one that's in a room that's at 80 degrees, a third one that's in a group at 60 degrees, and those are each of your experimental groups. Um, so that's how it works with an experiment. Question number seven. Addie is assigned to a group that does not receive the treatment being studied. What is her part in this experiment? So it's an experimental research project 
there is more than one group, there is a treatment that is being given to one group, but her group does not get the treatment. So what, what is her role in this? A, she is part of the exper- rather, she is part of an experimental group. B, she is part of the dependent variable. C, she is part of a control group. Or D, she is part of the treatment group. Well, the experimental group is the group that's receiving the treatment. That's, um, that's A. Uh, B, she's part of the dependent variable. Of course, it's not part of a variable. A variable is a thing that you're measuring about the people, so it might be the, the outcome that you're looking at. Um, she is part of the treatment group. No, because she is not receiving the treatment. That's D. So the answer here is C. She's part of a control group. The control group is the baseline group. It's the group that you look at to see how much of an effect the treatment has. And so she is part of the control group, the comparison or, or um, criterion group. I'm sorry, not criterion, but just the control group. All right, number eight. What did the Skinner box demonstrate? Obviously, you have to know what a Skinner box is. Uh, B.F. Skinner, Burris Frederick Skinner, was an, a uh, behaviorist, an operant conditioning person who looked at how reinforcements and punishments affected behavior. And a Skinner box was a thing, for instance, that he would use, a, usually he used pigeons, but in this question, we're, talking, we're gonna talk about rats. He would put them in the box and they would have to push a lever for instance, to get a pellet or to turn a light on or off or something like that. And so the Skinner box, here we're looking at A, the rat's ability to learn its way around a maze, B, the rat's ability to get out of a box, C, the rat's ability to find food, or D, the rat's ability to learn how to get its water. Now, all of these are methods that have been used in behavioral studies. Um, A, the rat's ability to learn its way around a maze, well, there's a lot of maze studies, but that's not what Skinner did. Um, similarly, the uh, C, the rat's ability to find food, that's really not what we're looking at either. Um, the rat's ability to get out of a box, that's a different kind of box. I think that's, uh, I can't remember the guy's name right now. Um, but what Skinner was specifically looking at was the rat's ability to learn how to get its water. And the idea here, for instance, is that it had to push a lever, maybe once, maybe a number of times, maybe push it and then wait a little while, then push it again in order to get what it's wanted. And the question was whether the rat would figure out the reinforcement schedule, what it had to do to get the thing that it wanted. In this case, it's water. Question number nine. Which of the following would be the likely IRB determination of Watson's experiment with Albert? Okay, there's a lot of stuff you have to know about already. IRB is short for Institutional Review Board, otherwise known as the Ethics Committee. Those are the people who review proposed research projects to see if they meet certain ethical guidelines, so if they're acceptable to conduct. Watson, that is referring to John Watson, the, uh, the seminal uh, operant conditioning radical behaviorist. And his experiment with Albert, there was baby Albert, where they brought in this little baby, put him down, and then they would... Uh, Bring a little bunny, bunny's wonderful and cute. And then uh, Watson and his research assistant would bang pots and pans around Albert and scare him. They were conditioning a fear of, you know, a little bunny. Um, there was more to the study than that, but that's a, that's a prime component of it. Now, um, here are the choices for this question. The IRB, would, that's the Institutional Review Board, would allow it as it was conducted. So no changes. B, the IRB would allow it as long as the mother was present. C, the IRB would allow the rat, but not the bunny, so one animal, but not another, whatever. Or B, the IRB would not allow the experiment. Now, let me tell you what our book says. Our book says D, the IRB would not allow the experiment because they're causing distress to this child. You know, however, in the real world, it's more complicated than that. Um, if the mother has given her consent and there is good reason for conducting the study and they take safeguards for the child's well-being. And if the study really does show something important that needs to be learned that makes a difference, then there are situations where the IRB would allow something like this to happen. They don't allow you to just like mess around with people for the fun of it. There has to be a good reason and the parents in this case have to give their uh, consent and it has to be supervised. But you know, anyhow, our book likes to say that, you know, Watson simply couldn't do it these days. I, I personally disagree with that, but this is what's going to get you points on the quiz. Number 10, similar question. What 
or excuse me, why are ethical guidelines valuable? So these are the things about research that talk about things like informed consent, voluntary participation, maybe anonymity and confidentiality of data. Uh, A, they reduce experiment liability. B, they limit the amount of research. C, they obligate participants to complete the experiment. Or D, they protect the well-being of the participants involved. The answer that is going to get you credit on this one is D, they protect the well-being of the participants involved. That's their stated purpose. Now, I truth, you know, I personally believe that the real reason we have ethical guidelines that get enforced is to keep the university from getting sued. And if the university didn't have to worry about getting sued, things would be differently. I'm not taking a very Kantian, strong, categorical, imperative, moral, you know, thing here. Um, you know, I will say they limit the amount of research. Yeah, actually, I personally feel the IRB does it. Me and the IRB have our issues. Um, or C, they obligate participants to complete the experiment. No, that participation is voluntary. The ethical guidelines don't uh, require people. In fact, they make it so people don't have to. I personally think that's a good thing. But let's just say the stated purpose of ethical guidelines is that they protect the well-being of the participants involved. Anyhow, that's question number 10, and that is the end of quiz one for chapter one on what is lifespan development. I'll see you for quiz two. Thanks.